Hey class, let's spend some time talking about influenza. Influenza, common time, oftentimes referred to as the quote-unquote flu, is a cyclical disease. It has cyclical increases during the winter months, so there's going to be higher incidences of influenza during the colder months of the year and lower incidences of this virus during the warmer months of the year. Some strains of this virus have been known to cause worldwide pandemics. Think of the 1918 influenza outbreak. We also have avian flu, and there's also swine flu. We'll talk more about those different strains later. This virus is very illustrative of how other viruses can cause serious diseases. In that, this virus oftentimes is going to be a zoonotic virus. It'll start in another organism, another animal, and then be transmitted to a human being after being altered in that other animal. Some signs and symptoms of influenza include an upper respiratory tract infection that can slowly progress to the lower respiratory tract. So there's going to be general, I don't feel good symptoms associated with influenza. Headache, dry, dry cough, chills, aches, fever, sore throat, extreme fatigue. And then there are some secondary infections associated with influenza as those fluids build up in the lower respiratory tract and become a breeding ground for bacteria. There are several different viruses that can cause influenza. They include influenza A, B, and C viruses. These are going to be um, categorized as orthomyxoviridae. Orthomyxoviridae is a strain of avian flu. We also have lipoprotein, these viruses will have a lipoprotein envelope that contains glycoprotein spikes, particularly they're going to have H and N spikes. The H is for hemo, hemoglo, hemagglutinin, and N is for neurodynamase. This viron also is going to have some ion channels to help move um, miner, mineral content in and out of its capsid. It has its genome stored as single-stranded RNA, and it has 10 genes located on eight single-stranded RNA strands. So here we can see the viron. It has its RNA inside of its capsid. This RNA is stored as antisense, or excuse me, negative sense RNA. And on the surface of the viron, we'll have that ion channel, we'll have the hemagglutinin, and we'll have the neurodynamase in addition to all that being embedded in the lipid envelope, which is going to be superficial to the matrix proteins that make up the capsid of our virus. If we zoom in even closer, we can see that the different surface markers on the influenza virus are going to allow for the virus to bind to target cells. And particularly, if we look right here on the H markers, those H markers are common targets for antibodies that we produce. And the gene that codes for that H marker on the influenza virus mutates very rapidly. And because it mutates very rapidly, it means that our influenza virus is going to have many different strains that our immune system will need to respond and adapt to. One of the main reasons that there's so much mutation is that the genetic information is stored as single-stranded negative sense RNA, the single most unstable mutation prone form of information storage with the nucleic acid. So there's some antigenic drift in influenza. Those glycoproteins, both the ACE and N genes, are going to constantly be changing and, and mutating, meaning that new strains of influenza are constantly hitting the world right now. We find that the, depending on the strain of influenza, there's a reduced host immune response to the virus. There can be some um, similarities that will allow us to have partial immune, um, a partial immune response to a new strain of the virus. But generally speaking, as the virus surface changes, we are going to have reduced immunity. If, if we have a very large shift in the genetic information, we are going to find that genetic information can be changed, exchanged between different virus species. This is going to happen all the time and can occur while two different viruses are infecting the same cell. This allows for brand new strains of influenza to be developed. For example, we could have 
the avian flu get into a pig and the human flu get into a pig and then they can be mixed and matched with the swine flu and then reintroduced to a human being that could make a new pandemic strain of the flu. Looks like I got a little bit ahead of myself here. We can see that the, here we have avian flu, human flu, mixing matching in the pig, and then we have a brand new form of the flu that makes us sick. The pathogenesis and virulence factors of influenza include the fact that the virus is going to bind to ciliated cells of our respiratory mucosa. As we talked about earlier in this chapter, there is a mucociliary escalator within our respiratory tract. This mucociliary escalator has many, many billions of ciliated cells. The, after binding, we, severe inflammation is going to be initiated. This irritation can also occur in the lungs and is due to a cytokine storm. The, as, the cells are infected with the influenza virus. The infected cells release dramatically high concentrations of cytokines that induce a large-scale inflammation of the respiratory tract. Hemagglutin binds to the host cell receptors and the neurodynamase is going to break down the mucus coating of our respiratory tract and it will aid with the viral budding and release of new viron particles. Way back in 2009, H1N1 variants were bound to lower more, bound lower in the respiratory tract, and they also bound more efficiently. And this caused massive cytokine storms and also caused a large outbreak of influenza. That sent many people to the hospital. A weird correlation about the uh, death rate of influenza is for those of you who work in geriatrics, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that shows that after Christmas time, during the month of January, there's a dramatic uptick in deaths from influenza compared to the month of December. If we look at our transmission and epidemiology of influenza, it's going to be um, inhaled when you in breathe in virus-laden aerosols a drop. So if somebody has influenza and they cough in front of you and you breathe in, you've just inoculated yourself with that virus. We can have direct contact with fomites, such as a doorknob or a straw. We could also have transmission being aided by the fact that we have to take lots of people and put them into a small amount of space that virus can very quickly move from person to person to person. In the winter months, dry air allows for the virus to be spread much more quickly and much more efficiently. Humid air is thicker, and that humid air is going to break down the virus more rapidly than the dry air. In the United States, there's approximately 36,000 deaths from influenza annually. Typically, influenza deaths are going to affect the very young and the very old patient populations. When we're trying to figure out if somebody has influenza, we can't do it um, um, with a genetic test every single time, just because it's not practical. The sheer number of cases would overwhelm our ability to test for them. So we're compromised, and we'll often just use symptoms alone to diagnose influenza. And because most cases of influenza are able to resolve themselves all by themselves, and they're caused by viruses which can't be treated by antibiotics, it's um, not something that there's a very strong motivating factor for to have a more accurate diagnosis because we don't have a large repertoire of drugs to even be administered in the first place. We can culture this virus and we can also have non-culture tests for those viruses to identify the specific subtype. Rapid influenza tests that are based off of immunological methods give us results in 24 hours, and viral culture counters are going to give us results in about a week, three to 10 days. These tests oftentimes are not going to be performed because we typically are just going to diagnose based on the symptoms of influenza. There are vaccines on the market to help us prevent or help prevent influenza infections. There are four main kinds of influenza vaccine. It's worth mentioning or worth emphasizing that every year there's a new influenza vaccine for a new mutation of the influenza virus. There are four main kinds of this vaccine. One is an inactivated vaccine designed for intramuscular injection. 
One is an inactivated for intradermal. Then we have a live attenuated for intranasal. And then finally, we have a recombinant vaccine. It's not grown in chicken eggs, and it's designed as an intramuscular injection. These first three versions contain egg albumins and are not appropriate for individuals that have egg allergies. But this final version is produced by genetically engineered microorganisms that make the specific surface proteins of the influenza virus and not the entire viral particle itself. New vaccine pr prospects right now are going to focus on targeting the ion channel proteins because those ion channel proteins have a much lower rate of mutation. And if we can uh, target the ion channel proteins, we'd have a much more robust, much more effective vaccine regimen for influenza. Influenza is one of the very first viral infections that the antiviral drugs were made for. However, these antiviral drugs must be taken very early on in the infection to have any benefits from them. Two antiviral drugs that can be used are amanidine and rimantidine. These two drugs are going to prevent and treat influenza type A, but not influenza type B. We also have xanamivir, which is an inhaled drug that works against both A and B. And then there's Tamiflu. Tamiflu, though, is starting to follow a favor because resistance to Tamiflu has been emerging within patient populations. It's worth emphasizing again that in many of these cases, um, there is no prescription or treatment given. The disease can resolve itself. In severe or acute cases, though, antiviral medications will be administered, particularly if you're working with a young or old population. So to summarize, with influenza, there are three main kinds of the viruses. We can get that virus by breathing it in, touching it, or eating it. If we look at this virus, the best way to uh, combat it is the vaccine. In acute cases of the viral infection, we can administer drugs. And every year in the United States, tens of thousands of people die from influenza. Up next, we have percussus, or pertussis, AKA whooping cough. Whooping cough, or pertussis, is caused by Bordetella pertussis. This is a bacterium that can be transmitted through droplet contact. And the signs and symptoms of pertussis include an incubation period of as short as three days to as long as three weeks. And then there's three additional stages. We'll have the catharal stage, the paroxysmal stage, and then the recovery stage. The second stage, the catharal stage, is characterized by very runny nose for a one up to two weeks. Then we have the paroxysmal stage, which is where we have the par paroxysms, or the bouts of very severe coughing. This severe coughing oftentimes is so bad that the patient doesn't have time to inhale air and can start to suffer from a lack of oxygen and a buildup of carbon dioxide in their bloodstream. And then finally, there's the recovery phase. This recovery phase is while well, the patient is convalescing. And the patient, while they aren't necessarily exhibiting the symptoms of whooping cough, are still going to be quite susceptible to other respiratory infections because of the damage that's been accruing and building up within their mucous membranes. To prevent whooping cough, we can take the Tdap vaccine. This is a very easily prevented illness. Unfortunately, as vaccination rates have been dropping in our country, we've started to see outbreaks of whooping cough, a formerly unheard of disease 15 years ago. If somebody contracts whooping cough, they can, it can be treated with uh, antibiotics. This vaccine does not provide lifelong immunity, and oftentimes there is a booster shot that is needed. And thanks to the anti-vaccination movement, this formerly prevented disease is making a comeback. So pertussis, aka whooping cough, is caused by Bordetella pertussis. It can be transmitted via droplets. To culture and diagnose, we are going to need to use some genotypic methods. To prevent this disease, you should get vaccinated. If you contract it, you should receive some antibiotics. And please, get vaccinated for it. 
The next one is respiratory syncytial virus. This is a virus or condition that is caused by respiratory syncytial virus. This viron is capable of being transmitted via direct contact, droplet contact, and indirect contact via a fomite. So if someone coughs on you directly and directly expels those droplets onto you, that would be the direct contact. We find that there's going to be um, a peak incident rate of this virus, RSV, during the fall and early spring months. What does this virus target? This virus pre um, preferentially is going to target young children and premature infants. And every year we find that approximately 100,000 children end up being hospitalized by this disease. Syncytia is a condition where multiple cells fuse due to viral infection. And this virus, respiratory syncytial virus, is known as the giant cell virus. This is a virus that's notorious for forming those syncytia, those large multinucleated cells that normally should not be present. We have found that we can give passive antibody treatment for high-risk children to help prevent the outbreak of this infection. There is currently no vaccine. Respiratory syncytial virus can be transmitted multiple methods. To test for it, we typically are going to use immunogenic methods. And thankfully, this virus has a mortality rate of less than 1%. So it's not a very dangerous disease compared to many of the other ones that are out there. That is all we have for this section. If you have any questions about the material, please feel free to post them on the discussion board or shoot me an email. Happy studies.